Thank you for checking out this next Select Aquatics Questions video. I had a company contact me in just the last couple months uh, after the posting of a video a while back on my shipping and I talked about how shipping had become so expensive. So we're partnering together to bring down my shipping rates and I'm hoping to start shipping again on the week of the 13th of June. So anyway, hopefully uh, all this will be kept up to date on the homepage at SelectAquatics.com and I look forward to start shipping out fish to you again soon. Now I'll start off this episode by saying that I've been keeping aquariums since I was in about 7th grade and I had a bedroom full of tanks by the time I was in 8th grade and I will tell you in all those years I was never a water tester. I did, never did much water testing. Uh, that's changed recently and I'll explain in a moment but um, as a rule I never, I never tested my water. Um, I needed to know what my pH was out of the tap and what my hardness was but then that's pretty much where it ended. So I kept, I've kept all the tanks that uh, every, all of you have had and, and that I receive emails about. I had tanks with, most of my tanks had a good inch substrate um, and I rooted my plants in the substrate. I never used soil in my substrate, but I did use uh, soil in pots from an early age. Um, but in fact, I used to have these tanks where I found that you could uh, root water sprite in, uh, in, in a substrate. And then as it grows up with a small pair of uh, scissors, I would trim the water sprite like bonsai, and I, and you would actually get a, a trunk that would that would develop would it look like bark, and I could have these things that look just like little oak trees that were actually water sprite. Uh, it, I, mean, I did it in 55 gallon tanks, so it gives you an idea about how big the plant was. But it was very cool. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing that. I've had under gravel filters for years, yada yada. Um, but I found as I started getting into some of the specialty fish, fish caught from the wild, and especially when I wanted to breed fish, that when I first set up a tank, there needed to be more concern spent toward setting up the tank so that you don't run into problems down the road. If you have something in the tank going on that's going to collect debris and collect mom and such over time, that deteriorates, that brings down your water quality, and it runs you into trouble, and it makes it difficult to keep a lot of the kinds of fish that are now available to us in the hobby and certainly if you want to breed anything. So uh, every once in a while I'll get a question from somebody and I'll answer it you know and then I'm not real happy with the answer or for some reason it just keeps chewing on me and I had someone write me a question uh, a couple of months ago and I just never felt that my answer was sufficient and my mind has been chewing on it ever since and it deals with this issue. So anyway, here's the, here's the question. So this is Jeff, and he writes and says that my hard water has killed everything I bought from you except one pair of tigers. Here's my most recent parameters. This is pure 90 feet deep well water. I don't do any treatments to the water, no RO, no buffers, etc. Uh, it has 20 grains of hardness, which is pretty hard, one part per million of iron, uh, 381 TDS, so I'll assume that that's pretty close to your GH, as we'll say it's uh, in the high 300s. pH 8.2, 8.4, that's pretty, pretty up there. Ammonia 0, nitrate 0, I'm sorry, nitrite 0 and nitrates are under 10 uh, ppm. I bought 100 shrimp, uh, cherries, a mono shrimp last year, all but one amano were dead. I bought your fish, all but one pair of tigers are dead. The two remaining appear to be doing well. Hoping for some acclimated offspring uh, one of these days. I bought a number of very nice guppies, red swords, mollies, had hundreds of babies, all fish, parents and children, all but one female have died. I added some cheap mollies the other day to see if they'd survive. But my Australian rainbows and my tiger barbs seemed to do well. So I wrote him back. And I said, well, the fact that you have zero ammonia and zero nitrates doesn't in and of itself mean that your tank is fine. There could be other issues. And that there's a lot more in an aquarium other than the, uh, the nitrate and uh, uh, ammonia readings. And I realized a lot of people go out and they have a problem with their tank and then they test the water assuming that that's going to uh, tell them what the problem is or tell them what's wrong, but water testing is just a, a signal. For, okay, like as I mentioned, I never tested my water. Well, 
Uh, I'm a, a, a care facility for the state of Colorado. I'm an animal animal care facility. So I have to qualify with a bunch of things, and including spot inspections where they come in surprise and uh, to see the fish room and all of that. Well, a while ago, uh, they started requiring that I test for my ammonia and my nitrates, and I have to send in the results every month, which I do now, and I've been doing it for a while. And my results stay at 0.25 uh, uh, ammonia, below 2.25 ammonia, and generally below 15 parts ppm of nitrates, um, which is about where I expected them to, 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 to be. But I've spent a lot of time setting up my tanks in such a way that, uh, that they should not run into problems and the water quality should stay low. And a big part of that is a minimal substrate, uh, heavy water changes, uh, filtration that removes debris from the water, and such. So anyway, I wrote him back, and he responds, so I hear what you're saying, but where are the numbers? Uh, what's, what numbers show up that cause the problem? Other than hardness and pH, all my numbers are well within parameters. What or where can I validate, calibrate the numbers causing the illnesses you were addressing? Just trying to understand before I make drastic changes. So. I wrote him back to say I would cut back on my substrate by about 50%. I would do, boost my water changes. Uh, he was using sponge filters, so I recommended that he go with uh, filters that remove debris from the aquarium and uh, bump things up. But he wasn't happy with the answer because it indicated to him big changes that he didn't think he needed to make. And I wasn't sure that I'd made the right, the right, um, the right response to him. And so my mind just started chewing on all the things that could, that could be going wrong in your tank, severe things that can cause your fish not to survive, but that would still result in zero ammonia and zero nitrate readings. So for instance, I used to live in Sacramento, California, and the water out of the tap was 8.2. So I had moved out there from the East Coast where I lived in Boston, and I used to breed angelfish. Well, that wasn't going to happen in Sacramento. So my Sacramento water could certainly be at zero ammonia and zero nitrate, but you know, angelfish weren't going to do very well in 8.2 water, and they certainly weren't going to breed. So there's a number of things. Temperature, of course, becomes part of it as well. Certain fish only do certain, well within certain temperatures. And your hardness also uh, has a lot to do with whether your fish are going to do right. If you're keeping African rift cichlids that require a higher pH and harder water, then you're not going, they're not going to do well if your pH is at 6.5 with a hardness of 70 or 90. I had someone write me the other day and said they've always wanted to keep live berries, but that was what their parameters were, 6.5 pH and uh, 70 uh, parts per million. And I said, you know, we talked a bit about it, and adding crushed coral, adding crushed oyster shell, uh, testing to make sure that your levels stay up where they belong. Um, but it's a lot more work if you're trying to keep fish that aren't acclimated to the water that comes out of your tap. So then my mind started going on it, and I come and started coming up with some of the others. The oxygen aer aer aeration in a tank is huge for a lot of fish. A lot of fish are very high oxygenation fish, and they only do best when the, water ox the dissolved oxygen level in the water is higher. Um, the amount of water changes you do every week. Uh, has a lot to do with it. You want to be doing, I consider a minimum of 50% a week, done over one or two water changes. Uh, currently in my room I do water changes a little more, but um, I have tanks with, you know, plecos growing out where they're getting a handful of green beans every day, so um, I'm doing 10 to 15%, well 15 to 20% water changes daily on most of my tanks. Um, but you don't need that, but you need to be at least 30 to 50% a week, and 50% is better than 30 is. The amount of light that is in on a tank has a lot to do with how healthy a tank uh, stays. Uh, the light stimulates bacterial activity, and your, uh, uh, your tank will be much healthier when, there, when there's an appropriate amount of light in the tank. And of course, if there's plants, they, have, they, need, they need light. Um, if the light isn't adequate and you've got plants in the tank, then you're going to get algae because the algae will outcompete your plants as the plants don't have enough light to, to digest and assimilate the ammonia and the nitrates that build up in your water. So without your light being appropriate, uh, you, can, you can run into problems. Where the tank is placed, here at Select Aquatics, I found over many years, from moving different species in, uh, in different places, that there are some species that don't do well in certain places and other species that do. 
For instance, my Zephothrus Montezumas did fabulous in two big 55-gallon tanks that were up way up in the air near the ceiling. They didn't do well out in my alcove that's a little bit cooler. So I'm assuming that the warmer temperatures provided by the tanks being up higher was part of the reason why they did so well. But a lot of fish really want to be near a window or they don't want to be near a window. They want to be on the lower rack or they don't want to be on the lower rack. And you'll find out over time that there are some species that really do do better uh, when the tank placement is um, Overall tank cleanliness. This, you, know, you can test your water, particularly if you test after a water change and have really low rating, uh, readings, but then you have a lot of mom and deteriorating organic debris going on in your substrate or collected in your plants or around your tank decor. Uh, that isn't good. So you, you want to try and keep your, your mom and your, your, your detritus uh, to a minimum. Mom is not inert. Some people think it is, it's not. Um, I don't, I run into problems almost immediately with a lot of my, uh, my plecos if I allow the mom to, to build up over time. They just start, I just start getting deaths. And uh, so you, you want to try and keep your tank environment fairly clean. The food's being fed, of course, my goodness. Um, you know, if you're feeding too much carnivorous foods, for example, and you're not feeding enough vegetable food with uh, some of your fish, enough spirulina flake and such, you'll end up with uh, their size and, and color weakening. Um, you you want to feed a balanced diet and you want to feed appropriately. Uh, smaller feedings fed a couple times a day are much better than big huge feedings in the evenings. So foods are really important. How often you feed is important. The size tank that the fish are in. Uh, you know, it's, if fish that are in too small of a tank, they don't grow to their tank size. That's, that's a myth. All it means is that you're creating stunted, unhealthy fish when you keep them in tanks that are too small. Uh, so you want to uh, be, be aware that that it contributes to the overall health of the fish in a big way. Uh, the, co the combination of the fish that you're keeping together, introducing stress to a tank because you have fish that don't get along, that's tough on any fish. You can imagine how it would be as a person. So uh, you want to make sure that your fish get along and that they're meant to be, they're meant to be kept with one another. And lastly, of the ones I came up with, was the lack of security or a comfortable environment. You have live plants in the tank where the fish can feel secure and can hide and, uh, and, and can do well and feel comfortable. One other factor that I came across here at Select Aquatics, and I, it's not on my list because it's, it's, um, uh, it's pretty specific to this area, but I found early on that I have a number of goodeeds here that, that do not do well and they die off within a couple of weeks when the tanks are covered. Uh, really firmly. So I'm at 50, I'm, uh, after a long time of looking at this and trying to figure out why that was the case. When the tanks were covered, uh, where there is some air exchange, I mean you've got air going into the tank, so you've, you've got fresh air going into the tank on a regular basis, but when the tanks were fairly firmly covered, uh, the fish would die after a couple of weeks. When the tops were taken off, then the fish did fine. So I'm at 5,200 feet. So the assumption is that, at least that I was making, was that the oxygen aeration uh, level, the oxygen assimilation level at the water surface was really important, particularly at this higher altitude, and that by further restrict restricting the air uh, exchange at the water surface, that I was creating problems for myself. That's not a problem that you would expect. My water qualities, my ammonia and nitrates could be zero but the fish are still going to show problems when I do this. So with certain gadeas, primarily all of my skiffias were this way, the crocodons were this way, uh, I, I, I keep them in tanks with a covering that is of that uh, permeable light great material or uh, I don't have them covered at all. So all those factors go into, uh, uh, into uh, your fish being healthy even though your water qualities and your water chemistry readings uh, could be a zero for ammonia and zero for nitrates. I've been waiting for this next question. I knew that someone would write it to me eventually, um, so I'm happy to share it with you today. Uh, Jessica writes, Hey Greg, I have a question for you, and no one seems to have an answer. Can I cook and eat a fish that was raised in an aquarium? I have some tilapia that when I got them were about an inch long, and they have grown up in a 150-gallon aquarium and are now about 8 inches long. Have you heard of anybody doing this? 
Actually, I do know something about this. I've been told, although I've never done it myself, that if you cook a fish in an aquarium, that the, the, the meat is very mealy and very mushy because there's no muscle tone. They've been in a box all their lives, and uh, you know they, they've really never developed any, any strength or firm muscle tone. So they're generally not good eating from a texture standpoint. Um, there's also an argument to be made as to how clean you kept your tank and whether or not um, you may may not want some flavors that you're going to get, but uh, um, what interests me is that I was down in Florida a couple of years ago, and when you drive along near the Everglades, they have these canals that are next to the roads, and in those canals are all these introduced, uh, often aquarium species, but one of the most common are oscars, and they have these big oscars, oscars that are swimming in these canals, and I thought, man, if I understand that they're good eating, and so I. I've often thought, God, if I lived here, I would, I would catch a couple and, and see if I could eat them. And so I've asked people who live down there, you know, uh, do you, have they ever had Oscar? Have they ever caught any and fixed them? And no one has. So if you are someone that has, uh, please let me know what it was like, and I'll be happy to share that information in an upcoming video. Thanks. Hatching brine shrimp is not difficult and can be done a number of ways. As long as the ratio of water, salt, and oxygenation is correct, you will receive a hatch. Most people will use a container where it narrows at the bottom, and a low to moderate strength air stone will keep the cysts in motion. They will then hatch in 24 to 48 hours, depending on the temperature. The ideal temperature is 80 degrees, and a full hatch will occur after 24 hours. They can also be hatched at cooler room temperature, hatching in 36 to 48 hours. Shrimp are hatched here at room temperature, and a batch made toward the end of the day, say on a Monday, is then harvested before noon on Wednesday between 36 and 48 hours later. Most hobbyists will build a shrimp hatcher out of a 2 liter soda bottle. You simply cut a hole about an inch in diameter toward the upper quarter of the bottle, and then put a small hole at the very top of the bottle that will hold an airline. By taking another 2 liter bottle and cutting off the bottom half, you can place the first bottle neck down into the second and have a hatcher that will sit upright. I used two hatchers exactly like this for many years, but there are numerous problems. First and foremost, if the airline tubing gets bumped or the bottle itself gets bumped, it falls over really easily. Spilled brine shrimp water is nasty, smelly stuff, and it's difficult to clean up. Even worse, your room where the brine shrimp are being hatched will take on that distinctive smell that only spilled brine shrimp water can create. But most importantly, when brine shrimp are hatched this way, you will often have batches that may not hatch. The basic rule is 2 quarts of water plus 2 tablespoons of salt plus 2 teaspoons of cysts. However, Depending on where the hole is cut in your 2 liter bottle, how much water the bottle will hold may be something less than the full 2 liters. The salt measurement is then inexact, and when you do get a hatch, you will get some hatch most of the time, the percentage of your hatch may be very low. All of my life I have wanted a brine shrimp hatcher where everything is pre-measured for optimum hatch, and the hatcher is clean and easy to sit up and tear down, and doesn't tip over. I wanted a hatcher that was durable and a sturdy piece of professional equipment, but that can handle daily use for many years and most importantly, will never spill. So I discussed this with a friend telling him I wanted to design a brine shrimp hatcher that was different than anything else out there, that could consistently and easily hatch brine shrimp for any hobbyist and would be durable enough to last many years. This friend has a small army of 3D printers and already produces the Levamisol cases and spoons for me, and he and I began a two-year dialogue to design and manufacture what is today the perfect batch brine shrimp hatcher. In 2019, 15 hatchers were sent out to Select Aquatics customers to try for their feedback. Based on their responses, further tweaks and improvements were made and more hatchers were sent out for feedback until I was happy that we had something that worked exactly as it should. Today they're offered in both blue and white and all black. In November of 2021, the first hatchers were sold and shipped, 
And as of April of 2022, approximately 150 hatchers have been sold and the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. When you first receive the hatcher, it will arrive in three bags within a small box. The instruction manual and all of the information about the hatcher is posted and linked from the homepage at selectaquatics.com. The only part of the hatcher that is not included is the 2 liter soda bottle and the consistently shaped 2 liter bottles used by the bigger soda brands such as Coke and Pepsi work great. When creating this hatcher I discovered that when you look at the soda bottles in your grocery store the bottles are all placed at the same place on the bottles regardless of the brand and all of the labels are the same size. So with a magic marker, trace around the bottom of the bottle along the bottom of the label. This places a line at the same place on every 2 liter bottle. Then remove the label. Then roughly a half inch below that line, toward the bottom of the bottle, make a cut to remove the bottle bottom. Different brands place a different molding line in this area and they are not always consistent. Then set the bottle aside. First open the bags and set out the contents, ensuring that all the parts are there. I personally check each box going out and everything you need should be there. The first thing you'll want to do is attach the legs. You will need the base, the three screws and nuts, and the three legs. Hold the base in your left hand, turn it over and drop one of the nuts into the three slots in the bottom of the base. The nut should fall back out easily. Place the screw end of the leg into the recess of the base and lightly hand tighten the Phillips screw. Do this for all three legs, then set that aside. Remove the three ring pieces from their bag and the ends will connect together easily. Then get the base and legs and place the tabs of the legs into the slots provided within the circular base. Once the tabs are in place, you can then tighten down the screws holding the legs to the base. Do not over tighten. Okay. Now screw the 2 liter bottle into the base. Once that is done, notice the tabs inside the top piece that are used to hold the top to the sides of the 2 liter bottle. With the side of the bottle slid into the spaces between the tabs and the sides of the tops, gently slide down the top so that it is firmly in place over the 2 liter bottle. Now place one end of the airline tubing over the air outlet in the base and the other end will run through the channel provided in the top that will hold the airline in place and keep the unit from back siphoning. The last piece is the top and okay I need to explain this. When we first made this everyone was happy with it and I was doing test batches to look for leaks, check on the hatch consistencies etc. But at least here for me the top would rattle when it was operating. It wasn't terribly loud, but the unit was pretty quiet, and the rattling of the, of the lid would be the only sound you would hear. So I experimented with a number of different types of bumpers that the top could sit on that would absorb the vibration. We couldn't find something we were happy with, and we continued to try different things. I've been putting small dabs of silicone into spots marked in the top where the bumper should be placed. You can certainly trim the silicone or remove it entirely or leave it as it is. Okay, so it's now set up and the airline is ready to be plugged into a small air pump nearby with a valve that will control the airflow into the hatcher. Fill the 2 liter bottle to the magic marker line and then plug in the air pump. The amount of air going into the device should be enough to keep all of the cysts in motion but not much more. If the airstream is too strong, it will simply break apart the baby shrimp as they hatch from the cysts. With the air going, fill the salt spoon to where it is evenly filled and pour it into the water. Iodized salt is fine, and long ago the added iodine was considered beneficial by many fish keepers to prevent thyroid problems in their fish. For the measurement of the salt to be correct, Granulated table salt is best. Do not use larger crystal salts such as rock salt or pickling salt as it will alter the measurements and the specific gravity of the mix which will then affect, affect your hatch rate. Then fill the cyst spoon and pour it into the water as well. Any amount of cyst can be hatched, up to two teaspoons, but the amount of salt in water is measured so that you will be at a specific gravity 
of 0 0.020 where you should have your greatest hatch rate. It does help to have the cyst hatching with the light shining onto the container, but whether light stimulates growth or it provides a little extra heat that boosts the hatching time, I don't know. Over many batches you will develop an eye for the shade of orange that will tell you that the batch is hatched and ready to be harvested. When the batch is ready, turn off the air pump and let the hatcher sit for at least four minutes. At that point, the cyst shells will have floated to the top and the newly hatched baby brine shrimp will have sunk to the bottom. Place the drain of the base over the brine shrimp net, place the drain into a half gallon glad type food storage container, and slowly back out the adjustable drain knob to allow the brine shrimp to flow into the net. On this hatcher, I opened the channel to make it slightly wider than in other types of hatchers so that it will not clog nor damage the shrimp before they are fed. Watch the bottle closely and turn down the knob as soon as the orange shrimp have left the bottle. Then discard the remaining water and cyst shells. Do not reuse old brine shrimp hatching water. The hatching water should be clear or just slightly cloudy. If you cannot see through it easily, particularly if it is a slight orange color, you may have waited too long to harvest the batch or the airflow from your air stone was too strong. Here the container is then put into the freezer for one hour and removed before it has frozen. The shrimp will have fallen to the bottom and can be put into ice cube trays with a turkey baster very easily and effectively. The ice cube trays are then fed to the fish and are good for weeks when frozen. The hatcher is then made so the top can be quickly pulled off and everything rinsed and cleaned easily and reset up to get a new batch going. And yes, you can put the newly hatched shrimp into containers of at least 10 gallons and raise them up to adulthood. How to do this is included in the instruction manual linked from the homepage at selectaquatics.com. I did it for a couple years, and but have not done it in a while and I don't have any to show you. Yes, they're the same thing as sea monkeys, and though the creator of sea monkeys claims his variety was a different line, they're still the same brine shrimp. I'm always interested in any feedback you may have on my hatcher, and because we are continuing to manufacture these ourselves, tweaks and improvements are always still being discussed and made. And if there is something you'd like to mention, please email me at selectaquatics at gmail.com, and I would love to discuss it with you. This line of Iliadon fursidens has been carefully bred here since 2004. First bred in trios for color and markings, today they are removed and sorted with each generation where they've been colony bred now for 14 years, and they've never been outcrossed. Numbers are low as they are recovering from a setback in 2019, and all of the fish in this video were filmed in April and May of 2022. sorting, I'll choose a flat area, like this time I'm using my table, I'll have some buckets down below, the main fish will come into this container and I'll divide them up, uh, males and females, uh, calls, uh, and other fish for separated for whatever reason, and then I can look at them as a group and pick for the most consistent fish, and when I'm positive about what I want, then they can go down into the buckets to be taken back and put into uh, their tank in the alcove. So this is the first group I brought back. There'll probably be about four groups of this size. And the first thing I look at when I'm starting to sort them is for natural uh, groupings. So the first thing I'm gonna do is pull all of the young out. Uh, and the young will go back into the tanks where they came from. The adults will go into different tanks. And the reason for that is that the young are accustomed to growing up in the tanks that they're in and I don't want to introduce the stress of moving them. Uh, the adults will go ahead and, and uh, be the ones who move to other tanks. So I have pulled out the young, and I learned long ago that whenever I have fish isolated like this, to use the opportunity to give them some brine shrimp to fatten them up so that the whole process is not more stressful for them than it needs to be. So I'll give them a minute or two here before I put them down into the bucket. Uh, so that the uh, bucket doesn't carry all the, uh, the uneaten brine shrimp in it. Um, but either way, they'll, they'll be back in their tank within the hour.
this leaves some pretty big individuals in there that may not be a good quality um, or their breeding, the amount of time left in their lives to breed is uh, not, uh, not worthwhile. So I'm going to go ahead and pull those guys out now. This leaves the fish that are going to be the nicest breeders, the one to be chosen as breeders. So this is just a small portion of them. So what we'll do now is separate them by males and females, and then bring in the next batch. I have found that the fastest way to do that is with these feta cheese containers. They're not 100% transparent, but I can see the fish fairly closely and can tell the males from the females fairly easily. With the selective breeding that's been done on this fish since about 2004, the females now have those bright black bars on both the anal and the dorsal fin, there's a female there, that the wild form of them doesn't have. And uh, it makes it much easier to sex these guys um, from a fairly young age, although these are already fairly adolescent. But we look to have two females and two males here. Whenever you breed up a lot of these fish, eventually, particularly these live bearers, you'll end up getting albinos or cystic fish, whatever. And I just noticed this. This looks like a melanistic fish. It's not particularly healthy. Um, we'll see if we can zoom in on them a little bit. So who knows? It looks like he's eating well. So we'll see if he grows out what he turns into. These are the biggest ones that have been pulled. Uh, they won't be used as breeders. They're elected from a previous generation that wasn't as nice. They improve with each generation. And uh, they're pretty good size. This is about as large as I ever get them here. I, there's a couple in there that might approach four inches. So there's a 55 waiting for them, and I'm going to just put them out to pasture in that 55 and let them live out their lives over there. So now the sorting begins toward the next generation. These are the males that were pulled, and these are the females that were pulled. Because my numbers are so low, I would never call any of these fish or destroy any of these fish yet. I'll hold out of these and let them grow out. If something happens to the population, then I have those other bigger fish uh, to get young from. So anyway, we'll start going through these guys now and see what we've got. We'll start with the females first, as they're easiest, in, this, in that there's the fewest decisions to make. And basically with the females, I'm looking for color in their dorsal and their anal fins, and also some color in their caudals. Um, when I first started working with the first about 2003, 2004, the females were just a basic slate gray with a little bit of markings in the, along the midline and possibly some spotting in the tail. But otherwise, there weren't any markings. So the selectively breeding for the nice males recently has produced uh, these markings that the females are now showing with the stripes in the anal and the dorsal fins. So those I will choose for. Taking into consideration that they're a little washed out from being spooked, this group is pretty consistent. Uh, they all have the markings in their anal and the dorsal, and decent markings in their tails. Uh, this guy over here probably has less markings than the other three, but I think that uh, each of these uh, will go ahead and be used as breeders. Now these four females, when compared to the last group, are much better. There's one here with the black markings are really broad and really deep. But there's also one individual here whose dorsal doesn't have much markings, and I probably am not going to use that one. That's this one right here. I'm probably going to go ahead and let that one go into the other colony. The markings in the dorsal are pretty indistinct. But like this one, is fabulous. I mean, those, those are nice markings, and I'm definitely pleased with that. Now this next group of four shows why you go through this process. There's a couple in here that have almost no markings in the dorsal fin, and definitely will not be used as breeders. Uh, that's, that one's markings are pretty weak. I believe this is the one that doesn't have any markings at all. 
and this one also has very weak markings in both the tail and the dorsal. So in this group, there aren't any firm females that I will want to use as a breeder. In this next group, it's something you'll see once in a while, and I always call for it. This fish in the back corner, if you'll notice, has no markings whatsoever in the caudal fin. So you don't want that to creep into your line. But that one in the back will definitely get pulled. And I don't think I'm going to use that one either because the color in the dorsal is not very good. Now this is a really poorly colored group. Uh, this guy in the back has almost no markings in the dorsal. This guy also has almost no markings in the dorsal or the caudal fin. This one looks good. I'll use that one. And this one... So it looks like there's only one in this group. That guy there that we'll use as a breeder. These are the last two females. Uh, this one's really good. This one, not so much. So, we got a 50-50 split on these two. I'll use the back one and I'll let the other one go in the other colony. Now here's the first group of males. The thing to keep in mind is the females are really important. 50% of your markings in color come from, from the females, so you want to make sure that the few things on the females that are important are, are met. Uh, and then the males, you get to choose for exactly the look you want to have. And in this group of four, there's a uh, one that is uh, fairly decent, and that he's got yellow in the, in the anal and the dorsal fin, got nice markings. Uh, there are a couple here that are a very not very good quality. And there's been one thing that's come up in this line. I don't know that we see it here, but we're going to see it soon. Is a red color that comes forward in this line. And I have not been choosing for it. I've been calling for the red since I've been selectively breeding this line. But I've been wondering lately, because it's looking very nice, whether I want to uh, leave some of it in or not. Okay, this next group of four has one in it that's a great example of that red I was talking about. You can see it in this guy right here. Really nice color in the tail, and like I say, in the past I've not been continuing with that. And I really don't know whether I want it to continue or not in the line. I mean, it's, it's very attractive. I won't call for it. What I'll do is I'll put it into the group. And I'll just keep an eye on it and how it progresses in the line. I put back three of the four of them and then took a closer look at this guy. I like the markings on the side. It's got the trout thing going on. The dorsal fin actually is, is fairly filled out and it looks like it's going to darken as it gets older. The tail is good. So I'm going to hold on to this one. This one will be a breeder. In this group, we have some really pretty fish. There's a couple in here I'll definitely want to use to carry on the line. The guy at the very top, I probably will pass on. There's not enough color in the dorsal. But at least two of these others look very nice. This guy here is really full of markings and throughout all the pins. So it may just be one in this group that I won't use that didn't have much color in his dorsal pin. That guy back there. This next group is also very attractive. 
but again we have some poor markings in the dorsal on three of the four. The fourth one, which is the one down in the corner, I like his markings in his dorsal and, and on his sides, and I'll use that one, but the other three will go with the, uh, the remainder of the colony. Of this last group of four, I want to look more closely at this one in the corner, but the others, again, have poor color in their dorsals, so they won't be kept as breeders. That one against that came out of the corner it has some red in its tail, but if the dorsal and the side markings are good enough, I'll go ahead and use them. So now there are two tanks of Fursidens Fry growing out. The other one is up here. And there's about 100 fry between the two tanks. Then all the fish that were not chosen as breeders for whatever reason are in this tank here. It's a 55. And this tank is essentially what the two tanks were that we started off with. And I will go through and pull any fry out of here uh, in another month or two and sort through them just as we did today with the fry that was in the other tank. And then all the fry that was pulled today, they will be gone through and sorted for quality once they hit adolescence. And this sparsely populated breeder tank for the first hit ends will just kept, be kept an eye on. They generally don't bother their fry when well fed. The tank has quite a few plants in it for the young to hide in. And we'll just keep an eye on this tank as they approach their breeding season, which will occur into the fall. Thank you for watching this most recent video. Um, as you can imagine, I put a lot of work into these, and so it's probably going to be a little while before I put another big one like this out. But I have a bunch of availability videos that are in the works and they're going to start getting released here as these fish are available to be shipped and I hope to restart shipping uh, on the 13th of June. I'll post everything at the home page, what's available and, and how the shipping is going and what things will cost. Um, right now the Atenobius Tauri, the Amica Splendens and my Limia Tigers are ready to go. Um, I'll put up availability videos for those but also I'll start po posting availability videos for the Xenotoca doedroi, the Zoogeneticus tequilas, my Odessa barbs, and of course the green dragons. Um, then down the road a little further from that, probably late fall, early spring, will be the Alfaro Coltratus, my Iliadon fursidens, and possibly the Cynodonus lucipinus. So thank you so much. I look forward to keeping in touch. And again, my goodness, if you've got any great questions, I would love to hear them and I can possibly use them in a future video. Thanks.